Magnets push and pull on other magnets. Charged objects push and pull on one another. But how? Does something literally shoot out of one object and cause a push and pull on another object? If you've studied physics at all, you've heard of electric and magnetic fields, but are these fields real things? If so, what are they? Or could it be that there really isn't anything there, that fields are just abstractions for making predictions? After all, we never observe fields per se. All we ever measure are the forces that magnets and charges exert on one another. Finding the answers to these questions will give us fundamental insights into the nature of electric and magnetic forces, and will reveal fundamental new scientific methods for penetrating even deeper into nature's mysteries. So let's discover the true nature of fields here on Inductica. <laughs> Often, people will have an intuitive sense of what fields are, but this intuition is usually a little vague. So let's return to the observations to find out how we should conceptualize fields. Before the concept of fields, scientists were only aware of electric and magnetic forces. Magnets pushed and pulled on other magnets, and charged objects pushed and pulled on one another. Later on, by rigging up ingenious ways of accurately measuring electric and magnetic forces, Charles de Coulomb showed that both of these forces obeyed an inverse squared law. What this means is that they diminish as the square of the distance. If you double the distance between the charged objects, the force is cut to one-fourth. If you triple the distance, then the force is cut to one-ninth, etc. If you'd like to learn more about these experiments, you can actually watch lecture 12 of my lecture series, An Inductive Summary of Physics, which is linked in the description. Coulomb's discovery is consistent with the hypothesis that there is some kind of emanation coming out of charged objects and magnets that causes these forces on other objects. Imagine if each charged object shot out some kind of emanation in each direction which caused electrical forces. If it did, that emanation would spread itself over a sphere of larger and larger radius. The emanation intensity at any given distance from the source would be proportional to I, the total emanations coming out of the charged or magnetic object, and it would be inversely proportional to 4 times pi r squared, which is the surface area of the sphere that the emanations are being spread over. This is consistent with the inverse square law that Charles de Coulomb already observed. So at this point, it's very plausible that fields are some kind of emanation shooting out in every direction from charged and magnetic objects. Next, the physicist Michael Faraday came up with the concept of fields. The idea that at each location, there is some line of force. In the case of electric fields, the field is an arrow at each location, which indicates the direction a positive charge will be pushed if it is at that location, and the opposite of the direction that a negative charge will be pushed if it is at that location. So these fields are probably feeling at this point like they really are a real thing. But based on the evidence I've shown you so far, I don't think their actual existence has been completely proven. So far, all we are certain of is an abstraction of action, that different actions will occur at different locations. The math of the inverse square law is consistent with the idea that some emanation is spherically spreading in every direction. But we don't yet know for certain that that is what's actually happening. Something may exist at that location causing the action, but based on the evidence so far, it's also possible that magnets and charges are simply acting on one another over a distance. Next, Maxwell hypothesized and modeled a medium which caused the electric and magnetic fields. Roughly, he modeled the electric field as a pressure in a fluid which filled space, and he modeled magnetic fields as vortices in that fluid. He designed this medium to have properties which would account for all of the electromagnetic phenomena which were understood at that point. Working with this model, he deduced that when a charged object shakes, it should produce waves of electric and magnetic fields. These waves were later observed by Heinrich Hertz. Hertz shook a charge using a spark gap, which is a circuit which causes charge to jump back and forth between two metal balls. According to Maxwell's hypothesis, this should make a wave which travels over to this second spark gap, where it would create an electric field which would cause a spark to jump back and forth over there. 
Through a series of many different experiments, Hertz found that these waves had all of the known properties of light, which proved that light is a wave of electric and magnetic fields. It's important to note, however, that this achievement did not prove the existence of the specific medium that Maxwell used to make this historic prediction. Now we're gonna use all of this historical information to answer the question, is there something there that actually carries these fields? And using special investigative methods that I've developed called broad physical categories, we can actually analyze Maxwell's math and prove that there really is a physical entity between charges and magnets which enables them to push on one another. Oh. Maxwell's fluid model leads to this equation, which describes the electric part of these electromagnetic waves. If you're afraid of math, don't worry, I'm going to be giving visualizations to explain what the math means. Now if you do like math and you already understand this equation, pay extra close attention because these visualizations are going to show show you what the hell all this math actually means physically. First, I'll describe a simple electromagnetic wave. Imagine we have a set of locations along a line here. At each of these locations, there's an electric field. Some locations have more, some have less. In some locations, the field is up. In other locations, the field is down. First, let's think about what this term on the right of the electromagnetic wave equation means. This is the second position derivative of the electric field. Now let's look at the left side of the equation. This is the second time derivative, which roughly tells us how the electric field changes over time. It's a second time derivative, so it shows us an accelerational change. So what this equation tells us is that the electric field changes at a given location based on the second position derivative at that location. But what does the second position derivative physically mean? To understand that, let's first think about what the first position derivative means. The first position derivative is the difference in the electric field between one position and a neighboring position. To understand what that means, let's zoom in on this part of the wave. This picture makes a comparison between three locations, the location in the center and the two locations to either side of it. We see here that there's a big difference between the location at the center and the location to the left, a big first derivative. And there's a small difference between the location in the center and the location on the right, a smaller first derivative. Now that we've understood the first derivative, let's move on to the second derivative. The second derivative is the difference of the difference. It considers the first derivative on the right and the first derivative on the left and subtracts them, finding the difference between these two first derivatives. So the way the electric field changes over time at this central location depends on the difference in the difference of the electric field between the right side and the left side. Let's break down what that means with some examples. If both sides have a higher magnetic field than the middle, then the second x derivative will be positive, as you can tell by looking at the signs I've added to that equation. As a result, if you look at the wave equation, you'll see that the e at that position will actually increase accelerationally. In contrast, if both sides are lower, you can see from the first equation, based on the signs that I've added, that the second derivative is negative. And the second equation tells us that the electric field at this location will decrease. It's as though E is flowing out of this location as a result of the neighboring locations having less E than the middle location. Finally, let's say that the left side is higher and the right side is lower. And let's further say that the difference between the center and the higher side is greater than the difference between the center and the lower side. If this is the case, you can see from the first equation, based on the signs that I've added, that the second derivative is positive, since the DE on the left is greater than the DE on the right. Therefore, the second equation tells us that the E at this location will increase over time. What this means physically is that if the difference between the higher side and the middle is greater than the difference between the lower side and the middle, then the electric field at this location will increase. 
It's as though E flows from regions of higher concentration to regions of lower concentration at a rate proportional to the difference in concentration. Now, I'm not saying that that's literally what's going on. I'm just saying that it is as though that is what's going on. All we know for sure is that E changes in proportion to this difference of the difference between the neighbors. Now, this breakdown of the wave equation enables us to prove that there's an entity at each location that carries the electric and magnetic fields. We know this because this situation has all of the characteristics of an entity. First, there is a capacity for action at each location. That's the field. Second, this capacity for action changes depending on what's going on nearby. The wave equation, to review, tells us that the field at each location changes based on the difference of the difference of the field at the neighboring locations. In other words, there is something there that can be acted upon. These two characteristics are what it means to be an entity. We know that a person we see is an entity because they act and because they act in a way which can be changed by nearby actions. For example, if you throw a tomato at a person, they will begin to act differently once the tomato reaches their location. In contrast, if something lacks one of these two characteristics, we know it isn't an entity. Take a character on a TV screen, for example. Though these characters act in certain consistent ways, their actions don't change when we act on them. If you throw a tomato at a TV character, the tomato will act on the screen, but the character will carry on as before. If you call the character's name to get his attention, he won't respond. This is one way that a baby might learn that TV characters aren't entities, and it's a way they could learn it even before they know exactly what a TV is. This is the standard you've been using implicitly your whole life to determine if something is an entity or not. Similarly, if you threw a tomato at a person and the tomato passed right through them, then you'd entertain the idea that the person wasn't really an entity. Instead, he might just be a hallucination or a hologram. So if you think about it, this is still the standard you use to determine whether something is an entity or not. And this same standard applies to this electromagnetic entity. So in general, an entity is a thing that acts and has its own properties. These properties are evidenced by the fact that the entity can be acted upon, that it will act differently when certain things happen nearby. These things, whatever they are, push on charges, they act. And the way that they push on charges changes based on what's happening nearby, the difference in the difference. They act like entities and they react like entities. They are entities. To deny that these things are entities, you'd have to deny that other things with these same two characteristics are entities. You'd have to deny that rocks are entities, that dogs are entities, etc. Because these two characteristics are the basis on which you judge that you're looking at a dog or a rock, not just a hologram or a hallucination. So is there actually something there between charges and magnets which is causing the force? Yes, there is a stuff an entity at each location that carries the ability to push and pull these magnets and charges. When this entity oscillates in its electromagnetic properties, that's what we call light. Historically, this stuff has been called the ether. Now, you may have heard that the ether was ruled out by the Michelson-Morley experiment. This is not the case, and I explain how in this video, which I've linked in the description. You might also object that you don't buy my argument, that my concept of entities is intuitive, but that science tells us that there is no ether, no entity carrying the field, and science should be placed on a higher level than common sense. This argument misses the fact that our knowledge of electromagnetism was only made possible by observations of the objects and their forces on one another. Think to the beginning of the history lesson. These observations rely on basic understandings of what entities, actions, and properties are. I'm not merely arguing from common sense here. I'm arguing from fundamental principles, principles you are implicitly using whenever you do science. Another important objection I often get at this point goes something like this. There is an entity, but physicists are already aware of it. The fields themselves are the entity. You're just making this needlessly complicated by bringing in the ether. This objection comes from a misunderstanding of what fields actually are. If you think back to the historical evidence for fields earlier in this video, 
you'll find that the conceptual content of fields is just the abstraction of action. Fields tell us only about what kind of action happens at each location. They tell us nothing about the entity that causes those actions. Now, real quick, what would it look like to actually understand the entities that cause these actions? An example of this would be Maxwell's model. Maxwell explained the magnetic force by hypothesizing that different parts of the ether rotated, stretched, and contracted, and that these stretches and contractions cause forces on magnets and wires. If you'd like to know more about this model, you can watch this video, which I've linked in the description. Now, I'm not saying this hypothesis is right. I'm saying that we need to find an explanation like this, an explanation that explains the actions of what we observe light and electromagnetic forces in terms of an entity, an ether, and its particular properties. So the fields are not the entity. Understanding this is crucial. We can only understand what's really going on if we differentiate the abstractions of action, the fields, from the entity that commits those actions, the ether. Treating these fields as though they are the entity itself prevents us from making progress, since the actual conceptual content of fields gives us nothing more than an abstraction of action. And this is exactly what physicists have been doing for over a century. Physicists don't ask about the nature of the underlying entity which causes the fields because they either don't think there's an entity there or they think the field is the entity. If you think you already understand the nature of the underlying entity when in fact you only are aware of the abstraction of action, you are unable to hypothesize and to make inferences about the nature of the actual underlying entity. Conclusions. Number one, is there actually something between two magnets which causes them to push on one another? Yes. It's the ether. Number two, fields are real, but they tell us only about actions, not about the entity causing those actions. Number three, in order to make progress, we need to keep the concept of fields and the entity causing them separate. Only then can we make inferences which penetrate deeper into the nature of these phenomena. The fundamental approach of Inductica is to use new epistemology that is, new scientific methods, to approach the challenges we now face in physics. As a closing note, I want to point out two aspects of my theory of induction that I used in this video to make important identifications and to show how these methods of induction will be useful in making further progress. First, in this presentation, I went back to the observational evidence to gain clarity on what fields actually are. My theory of induction includes a specific method of how to go back to the evidence and use it to clarify our existing concepts. To see one of these inductive reproofs of physics, click on the playlist linked in the description. Second, in my breakdown of the wave equation, I was able to prove that there is an actual entity which underlies fields. I was also able to clarify the difference between the capacities for action, the fields, and the underlying entity causing those actions, the ether. This analysis and many more scientific inferences are made possible by broad physical categories. Broad physical categories are concepts like entity, property, action, relationship, and cause. Reasoning with these concepts helps us make inferences about the underlying nature of things. In this video, I proved the existence of an entity that we can't see. An introduction to my theory of broad physical categories can be found in this video. Both of these aspects of my theory of induction will be useful in making further progress in physics. By using the method of inductive reproof, Inductica will bring further clarity to more of our existing physical concepts, just as we brought more clarity to the concept of fields in this video. Armed with these clarified concepts, Broad physical categories will help us make deeper inferences into the nature of the ether. To support the project and to gain access to even more revolutionary ideas, go to patreon.com inductica. I'll see you next time as this inductive journey continues.